Good evening and welcome. Tonight we will be going over the history and geography of Arkhangelsk Oblast in Russia. Now just a quick note before we get started. Since people have left angry comments on previous Russia videos saying things like if you do another video about Russia I'm going to unsubscribe which I understand that Russia is one of the major enemies of the world at the moment I, I get it but um, also I'm covering every region of the world in alphabetical order I'm not going to skip over the largest country, right? And remember that there are no bad countries, only bad leaders, only bad politicians. And, you know, I obviously won't say their name, but the current leader of Russia has, what, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 tops before they either step down or croak. Like, this too shall pass. Do not worry. I, too, once lived in a country that invaded another one and lied to the people of my country about it, to justify it, and the people of my country believed it. And now, 20 years later, feel a lot of embarrassment and shame about the lies our government told. And that could very well be the story of Russia someday. So, relax. It's a relaxation channel. Let's learn about it interesting corner of Russia, because I guarantee you, you're going to learn something neat. This is Arkhangelsk Oblast here, but there's so much more to it. First of all, this up here is the Nenets Autonomous Okrung here, which is technically part of Arkhangelsk, but it's going to have its own separate video someday, so we're going to ignore this whole section here and talk about it on another day when it's its time. So besides that, Arkhangelsk has a lot of very interesting islands. Why don't we start north and work our way down? The first set of islands are way up here, which is why we're at this interesting angle. This is Franz Joseph Land. This region is uninhabited. There are only people temporarily stationed there, and it's technically, I think it's like a, not a national park, but a nature reserve that you can do tours through boats or even flying over it, and it's all very glaciated and icy because it is within the Arctic Circle. And if you're wondering why it's called Franz Joseph Land in Russia, since Franz Joseph was the Austrian emperor, uh, wait, you'll find out. Then we have this huge island here. Sorry if you heard that spam caller just called my phone. This huge island here, Novaya Zemlya, which I believe just means northern island. And I believe it's Russia's largest island, if I remember my research. But what's interesting is that it is not one island. It is two. There is a little strait right here that creates the northern island, or uh, Severny, and the southern island, or Yusni. And this too is mostly glaciers, mostly ice and rocks, very few settlements on here. But a very important part of Russia's history, and we'll talk all about it. Then we have one more set of islands, which sadly, this map doesn't do a good job of showing because it's right here. This, this name here is blocking it. This is the Solovetsky Islands. And they are so important to Russian history that it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So let me grab my tablet, figure out how to show it to you at this angle, and we will read the summary here together. The Cultural and Historic Ensemble of the Solovetsky Islands. 
the Solovetsky Archipelago comprises six islands in the western part of the White Sea, covering about 300 square kilometers. They have been inhabited since the 5th century BCE, and important traces of a human presence from as far back as the 5th millennium BCE can be found there. The archipelago has been the site of fervent monastic activity since the 15th century, and there are several churches dating from the 16th to the 19th century. Let's look at some of the pictures here. Oh, there aren't any. There's only the one. But we'll look at more on Google Earth. I have a lot of cool pictures to show you. So yes, those islands we will be talking about in the history portion. The rest of it, however, is very uh, forested, I would say. Um, sort of flat, not flat flat, but pretty flat. Lots of beautiful trees, part of the taiga northern landscape as well. But what really dominates it is the Divina River, as you can see here, flowing out into the White Sea here. Very, very important to its history and the history of Russia. So why don't we get into it? So like it said, many early peoples living here. The first settlements along here were probably the ones built by the Vikings, however. The early peoples, you know, they had their regions. The Vikings came and dominated them. And came and went, to be honest. Some stayed, some left. But eventually, the area became absorbed by Novgorod around the 1100s. Novgorod being one of the predecessors to what would eventually become Russia. It's a lot of puzzle pieces that came together to form Russia as we know it today, and that was a big one of them. They founded a monastery here to the Archangel Michael. Oops. Yeah. It's hence the name Archangelsk. Archangelsk. That's where it got its name. And it was very important being here along the sea and the river because of the fur trade that could sail out here or sail down to more populated areas of what was then Novgorod. Via Zemlia was discovered around the 11th century too during that expansion of Novgorod. Just keep that in mind. In 1478, the area was absorbed by the Grand Duchy of Moscow, which was the final big puzzle piece to create what we now know as Russia. And this is when the Solovetsky Monastery would have been built here, with monks coming there to study and pray. That was built by Ivan the Terrible, and it was built up over the years to create more of a fortification, because if you haven't noticed, we have Finland and Scandinavia just a hop, skip, and a jump. Now, this region became very prosperous because of the trading, but there was one big issue in that this sea here was frozen over for six months out of the year. So for the spring and summer months, the trade was booming, the city was thriving, the trade was going in and out, helping Moscow become more and more wealthy. But for the fall and winter seasons, nothing. No trade whatsoever. So they fixed that problem by 1703 by building the city of St. Petersburg, which you can see down here. Much farther south, but still along the water, so that they could trade through here. And the city up here of Arkhangelsk rapidly declined in importance and in its economy. Still important, but not nearly like it used to be. 
In the late 1870s, Russia, as it's now known, along with many other countries, were low-key obsessed with the Arctic Circle and trying to find the Northern Passage or Northwest Passage, a sea route that would easily take you from one side of the planet to the other. But the issue is that, like the White Sea over here, it freezes over completely, so many expeditions were complete failures, trapped in ice, or had to turn back one way or another. But it led to many discoveries up in the Arctic Ocean, and one of them were the islands of Franz Josef Land. It was an expedition in 1872, led by an Austrian team that named these islands, and the current emperor at that time was Emperor Franz Joseph. I actually did a History Magazine article about him on my channel already. Hence the name. Let's skip to World War I, or pretty much just the end of it, which completely transformed the country of Russia in many, many, many ways. By 1918, the Tsar was no more, and many rebellions were springing up against the Bolsheviks that had taken over the government, creating a communist country. The communists were known as the Reds. The rebellious movements against them were known as the Whites. And Arkhangelsk was a very important area for the Whites. In fact, some British and an American squadron came here to help try to stop the Bolsheviks from expanding. And many battles were fought over here. It was known as the North Russia Intervention. But by February 20th, 1920, the Reds would invade Arkhangelsk and would eventually become absorbed into the Soviet Union. Beginning in 1921, Solovetsky Island was completely taken over. The communists being fervent atheists, they removed all of the monks. One way or another, you know what I mean. And they turned the island into a gulag, which is a Soviet prison. There were also prisons in Arkhangelsk and in the area here, because it's you know, technically Siberia, you know. But this was a very big, important one, and it remained a gulag until 1939, only changing because World War II was breaking out, and they were worried that the Germans would come via Finland, Scandinavia, and take over the island, so they abandoned it. But going back just a little bit, let's talk about the islands up here. Franz Joseph Land had been sort of a no-man's land, kind of like Antarctica is today, where it was agreed upon that it shouldn't really belong to anybody. But unlike Antarctica, there was no official statement saying that. It was just kind of like a de jure no-man's land. Sorry about the helicopter overhead. Uh, where was I? In 1926, the Soviets just took them and said, this is ours now. We're gonna, like, you know, send troops up there just to kind of inspect it, but they never really did much with it. it never really did ever, and never really could, because it's just a bunch of ice and rocks and walruses, you know. Not much for the Soviets to try to do up there. But now let's get into World War II. Since Arkhangelsk saw quite a few battles, the Germans attempted to invade via Arkhangelsk quite a few times and were unsuccessful. There was also a convoy arranged by the Allies that had bases in Novaya Zemlya. The goal being they would fly supplies here and then the Soviets could intercept and get it into the Soviet Union, since, you know, they were all allies together at that point. And there were quite a few German attacks uh, above the water and below in their U-boats. 
try to stop that, and sometimes they did. If, if I remember correctly, I think there was one or two where they actually destroyed the convoys, but for the most part, they didn't. But it's interesting how this big icy island was very pivotal to the Russian front here in World War II. Not just for the Russians, but for the Germans as well. The Germans tried to set up some bases there as well as they tried to, to conquer Europe. But World War II ends. Soviet Union is part of the winning side. And they entered their next big era, which was the Cold War and the Nuclear Age. And the Soviet Union began building atomic weapons. And testing them. And the perfect place to test them was this huge icy island up here. The biggest test being in 1973 when they detonated the Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon ever detonated and the largest explosion ever caused by man in history. The shockwaves were felt all around the Arctic Circle, and the effects were felt as far as New Zealand. It was that big of a bomb. And the Tsar Bomba was really the beginning of the end of the nuclear program in the Soviet Union, because the whole world was like, what was that? We all felt that. This should not be something that exists. And slowly... The nuclear program started to wind down, not just in the Soviet Union, but in the United States as well. It was clear that it was becoming way out of hand. In total, the Soviet Union detonated 224 nuclear weapons in Novaya Zemlya. So if you're wondering why there's so few settlements here, that would be why. As the Soviet Union started to collapse, things changed in these areas. In 1990, Franz Joseph Land was opened up to whoever wanted to come research or explore, which is still true today. And Arkhangelsk, the city, was actually not doing too bad under the Soviet regime, unlike many parts of the Soviet Union. The industry build up here was actually quite helpful to its economy and when the soviet union collapsed in 1991 so did the economy here in arkhangelsk it's never quite recovered since then it's still like very much a struggling city compared to other major metropolitan areas and trading centers of russia but it's still hanging on there it's still bustling and busy it's very important to the timber industry of Russia, it being very forested up here in the taiga, and them being able to send logs down the Dvina River here to import and export what they need. And Solovetsky Island very happily has a happy ending. The monastery was built back up, and there are monks there to this day. It's a big museum center, so you can see the history of this island playing out. And it's like a, a wonderful cultural center, not just for Russia, but for the world. And that is the history of Arkhangelsk. Very, very fascinating. All the regions of Russia I've done so far have been in the way eastern part of Russia. I, this is my first one in European Russia. So there's a lot of history to dig through. And it was all very interesting, I thought. So why don't I grab my tablet and we can explore our Kongelsk together. So here I have highlighted our Kongelsk Oblast. You can see the mainland there and the island. But let's start in the city itself, Kongelsk, right here. There we go. There's the city. And you know what this kind of reminds me of? If you go like this, and then you just filled this with city, it kind of looks like Stockholm in a way, right? And it's kind of that same port 
culture that Stockholm has just way shrunken down and Russian obviously. <laughs> so we're going to take a peek at the Arkhangelsk Regional History Museum. It's a beautiful little imperial era building here observatory by the looks of it. This tower also, in any picture I see of Arkhangelsk, I see this tower, I bet it's like the most famous skyscraper, very Soviet era looking, right? So here we can see some cool looking ship models, probably once sailed into the city here. And they're also very Soviet looking, isn't it? This is clearly a model of them building the fortifications of the monastery. These guys are very dapper down here. They're big hats. Look at this. It looks like a treasure box, doesn't it? Another cool ship. This is, we're gonna look at next, the monastery by the looks of it. Some um, artifacts probably also from the monastery or maybe even from the old Archangel Michael Cathedral here in Arkhangel live events by the looks of it. Some more cool looking artifacts. Looks like a really neat anchor right there. A cross, maybe also from, maybe from the original monastery or the cathedral. But it's not a orthodox cross, is it? So I wonder if it is from the monastery. I'm not sure. But a little, I guess, a demonstration here of old timey photographs. There's this guy. Oh, you know what? It actually says in English who this is. Is it Peter the Great? Let me see. It is indeed Peter. Peter the Great. How interesting that the captions are in Russian and English. That's unusual. For, like, Western Russia, but I guess not because of surgery around there. It's very close to, like, English-speaking Europe, I suppose. It is technically Europe after all. So, unfortunately, the rest of the town, you can see it's very Soviet planned as well, all very grid layout there. There's not many other cool things to see in the city, and all of the towns out here are very, very rural to the point where there's no pictures. Let's just pick a random one. No pictures, or the pictures are just of, like, fields. Let's see, Samo did here. It's a little lake bridge, lots of little flowers and fields, things like that. It is very rural. That's a beautiful church. It's blue. <laughs> so yeah, nothing too exciting to show you on the mainland, unfortunately. But let's head over to the islands here. Slovetsky. And we're going to see, just go to the goods. It's a pretty botanical garden there, but I'm not sure I'm going to show you. There we go. The monastery. Solovetsky Monastery. You can see from a distance the original like church there and the fortifications that were built long after and the little community there for the monks or worshippers. Of course, the typical onion domes of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. A little chapel by the looks of it there. Very huge complex here of buildings. So much history. Snowy too. Here's the interior of the, I guess the chapel. I don't know what they would call it in Orthodox. But it's very gold, isn't it? With all the icons. Also very typical of Eastern Orthodox religion. The cannons there. I'll show you that in a second as well. Big old bells as well. And there's a guy. <laughs> he looks very stern. But we can check out the actual Fort Museum here. and explore the history of them keeping this place safe originally from the Swedes, I would assume way back in the day 
and then eventually trying to keep people in, right? Very ominous. Something talking about there. 1876, it says. I should brush up on my Cyrillic. I used to be able to read it, no problem, and then I stopped practicing, and now I can't really remember. Here is the Gulag Museum about the history of the decade or so, and this was a prison. Here you can see pictures of this canal that was built over in the mainland, mostly to give the prisoners here something to do oh, and, you know, help thin the population of the prisoners, if you know what I mean, like on purpose. Apparently that canal was never really even used because it was too shallow. It's a tiny letter right there. So it took many, many lives for like no reason, just to keep them busy. All kinds of little brochures and artifacts here. Probably some propaganda, right? Diagrams there. Some more artifacts, playing cards, spoons, and cups. That's neat looking outside, what they would have seen. A uniform. A quote, which I'm sure is very meaningful. Look at from a distance, it's so pretty is a very important spot for the history of Russia and for this corner of Eastern Europe. Mm. There's a deer. Or maybe a caribou, I'm not sure. But there's a lot to see here on the islands. Like I said, the gardens are very pretty. But I want to show you some other stuff. We have more to see, so I highly encourage you exploring these islands, because like I said, it is a UNESCO site, important to world history. Let's head over to Novaya Zemlya, which you can see is very, very glaciated, very typical for the Arctic Ocean. We have a little national park, Russia Arctis, with a little polar bear having a big leap. It would be cool to see polar bears in the wild. Beautiful glaciers. I love this color of like the calved glaciers and you can see the inside all bright blue. It doesn't look like a natural blue, right? But it is. So that's that national park. You can see right here where the island is split in two. So even though it looks like one big island from way above, it is technically two. And this here, this peninsula, is where the Tsar Bomba was detonated. There's nothing denoting it. Just think they don't want people visiting for obvious reasons. But that's where the largest man-made explosion in history occurred. Let's see if we can't look at... Maybe some of these little southern towns have some pictures for us to see. Oh, look at all the trees. You wouldn't expect that. Little fungi. Lots of fungi. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So yes, look. Oops. There we go. Little villages here. Nothing too grand, right? Mostly just fishing villages. You can't even see it from above. They're so tiny. Let's see across, you know. Nope. A little settlement there. And look how massive this island is. I believe this is Russia's largest island here. Yeah. Oh, this would be Russia's largest island. And then let's end our little tour here in Franz Joseph Land, which nothing pops up, so I've got to type it in. Let's see? Franz Joseph Land, which is also very beautiful and it's remoteness and glaciation and also there's a bunch of walruses here apparently it's very like serene then you see the walrus friends come in <laughs> so yeah mostly these islands so there's that beautiful blue again these islands are used for research purposes or for extreme tourists who just want to claim that they've been to a remote arctic archipelago <laughs> it's mostly just a walrus hanging out by the looks of it. Right. Wow, look at these old abandoned ships. Maybe they were washed ashore by accident. 
if it's just people looking at these walruses. Interesting form of tourism. So I think those are all the highlights to show you. Maybe we will close out on the botanical garden. Why don't I show it to you? It is very pretty. Or maybe we'll just do the... Hello? Nope, okay. I guess we're doing the garden. And I just show you the general island slideshow, but it doesn't want to. So let's look at the little garden here. It is quite lovely. So thank you so much for watching. Cute. If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing. This is an ongoing series on my channel. And next, we are going to be heading over to Mongolia. We are going to be looking at another very important religious site in Mongolia, which is also a UNESCO site, but not for any Christian religion, not for probably any religion that you can think of. Not Islam, not Buddhism, not this loud helicopter flying above me either. So I think it's time to close out the video. I hope that you found this video to be relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a good, good, good night.